We're in Bristol, UK, downtown in the city center, and we're at the New Room. And we are talking to... David Weeks. And Mr. Weeks, Robert Weeks, what do you do here, and what's your connection to the New Room? I'm a Methodist minister, a retired Methodist minister. If we ever do retire, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, I'm a Bristolian, eighth generation Methodist. And therefore, when I retired and came back to Bristol, which had been my home, I wanted to be connected to this place. It's the earliest Methodist chapel there is in the world, and I thought, I'd just like to be part of it. So for the last 14 years, I've worked here as a deputy warden, as warden, and now I'm chaplain. What is the New Room? New Room is the oldest Methodist chapel in the world. Um, John built it because when he was meeting with the religious societies in Bristol, that was sort of groups of enthusiastic Christians who were a bit worried about the state of the church at the time. They met in rented rooms, and very often they were so crowded in them that he feared the sort of floor would collapse. So he decided they needed a new room for them to meet in. And so that was the beginning of this building, 1739. Now the Wesleys have a strong connection to Bristol. Both of them do, don't they? Yeah. I mean, John did because it was the first place where he ever did open-air preaching. I mean, that was the thing. That was where I think he discovered uh, what really his purpose was. Uh, he came at the end of March in 1739. And on the Sunday, he went with George Whitfield, three different places in the city, and saw John preaching in the, uh, saw George preaching in the open air. Uh, I think he was a bit embarrassed by it. He felt, in a way, the right place to preach was in church and doing it in sort of broadcasting it just in the open to anybody who wanted to listen. There was something not quite right about it. Um, but he was so persuaded that the next day he began to preach in the open air himself. Uh, I think George had already fixed it up, and probably it was in the press already to say he would be doing it. That was George Whitfield's way of persuading people to do things, advertise it in the press, and then tell them that was the way of it. And so John did, and I think he was just staggered with the response of people, particularly out to the east of Bristol, where there was the Kingswood Forest, which was a mining area, where there were no churches at all, where the people had been really ignored by the church, a bit feared by the city because being miners they were a fearsome lot. And he was just amazed at the response. So for the rest of his life that was what he did. But the interesting thing is, um, 1776 I think it is, he writes to say, even today field preaching is across to me. So he did it not because he enjoyed it, not because he felt it was his thing, but because it was worked. It was where people were to be found and where he could reach them and where they could respond to the good news he wanted to share. So that was it. And that was a special link with Bristol and brought him back to Bristol twice every year for the rest of his life. He was always here at the beginning of the year and at the end of the and towards the end of the year, just seeing how the church was developing, how the work was developing, not just here in Bristol, but in Bath, down towards Pensford, down towards the southwest, all over the place. So Bristol did have a very sort of important part in his life. For Charles too, um, Charles at first travelled around on horseback as John did, um, but then in 1748, he, he fell in love and got married, and he settled here in Bristol. His wife came from across in Wales, so this was near to, his, to her home, but also was right in the centre of the Methodist work. So he came to live here, and he lived here until 1771 when he moved to London, really, I think, for the sake of his children's music. Both were musical prodigies, and it was felt they had much better opportunities in London than they did in Bristol. So both have their, 
have their place. This is why we have a, a statue of John out there in the front courtyard and a statue of Charles in the back courtyard. They both have their place in, in Bristol. Now, the statue of John has him on horseback. Yeah. That's a common place for him, wasn't it? Very much so, yes. I mean, it was his way of going around the country. In, in this way, he was very Pauline. You know, Paul moved around, telling people the good news, gathering them into small groups, and then off he went. John did exactly the same. He would come here to Bristol, and he began the society, but then he would move on. And he moved on and moved on, all the time founding societies, but keeping in touch with them, both by visiting them the next year or maybe the year after, also through letters and such like. So he travelled on horseback. That was the easiest way to do it. He found he could read easily when he was on horseback. The horse he felt knew the way better than he did, so he didn't have to, to worry about that. He travelled about a quarter of a million miles on horseback during his lifetime. It was only later when he was in his 70s they persuaded him in fact to use a chaise rather than continuing on horseback all the time. He also felt it was healthy. Remember there's a time when John wasn't, uh, Giles wasn't well and John advised him, you know, get out horse riding, get some air into your lungs, shake your body up a bit, you'll be much better because of it. <laughs> One of the things that Wesley did was he kind of shook things up. And, and we were talking about the field preaching, uh, the societies that were created. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what Methodism was was very different from what the Anglican practice was. Yes. Can you talk, com, kind of compare the two of them a little bit and, and what Wesley really did? He's talking to actually, there are two groups yeah. of people, aren't there, between those that were attending the Anglican church and those that may have been hearing him whenever he was field preaching? Church was going through a difficult time then. I think it was partially the sort of, uh, the thought of the time, which was very skeptical about religion. I think the worship of the church seems to have become fairly formal in that time. There was a lot of absentee clergy who took the benefits of the living, you know, of doing the job, but then employed somebody for much less than they were paid to look after their parish. I heard of one bishop, having been appointed to it, he moved to London. The only time he went to his cathedral was when he was buried. Never been there before. Spent all of his time in London. So the church was going through a difficult time. And I think both John and Charles wanted through their own experiences and sharing them, and then sharing the experience of others too, um, to bring new life into the church. It's very rarely the church welcomes that. Institutions don't like to be changed. They resist alteration. They like the way generally the things are. But always there are people within the church who have vision and who know the way things are and not the way things God wants them to be. And these were the people who, who gathered in the, uh, the religious societies. That's why they welcomed John and Charles and George Whitfield and the others, even though the church doors were being closed to them. And people said, no, 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 no we, we, we don't want to care. You disturb people. You know, you imply uh, good Christian people are not sincere followers of Jesus Christ. And for goodness sake, think of some of the people you bring into church, you know, and you encourage to come. Uh, no. So the church doors closed, the doors of the societies were open, and those John encouraged. And that's why the early Methodist groups were never called churches. They were societies. Even when I became a church member, I was enrolled in the Methodist Society here in, in Bristol. That was what he wanted, something to revitalize um, the life of the church. But as I said, the church doesn't always welcome that. History often repeats itself too, doesn't it? 
so I often think of Charles more for his music than anything else, but he was a, a preacher, a religious leader. Yes. What was his life like here as a, a religious leader within the Methodist faith in, in Bristol? I think the great contribution that Charles made to the church here was just by being here. So he encouraged it. I'm sure that many of his early hymns were tried out here, you know. And so they were very blessed in this congregation um, to have him here over a number of years. And I did read that, in fact, even after he left Bristol in 1771, um, he continued to come back to Bristol every summer. He didn't like living in London during the summer. So he came back to Bristol and there was a house for him. So the church here continued to have his encouragement. But I mean, he wouldn't have kept it just to here. It would be in the whole area around uh, where he could travel and encourage the societies here. So they were blessed indeed. Can you tell me a little bit about the facility that we're, the, the building that we're in, the new room itself? Yeah. When John came to Bristol, it was the end of March 1739, and he found a welcome by the religious societies, which uh, George, through a couple of visits, had been building up. But he was worried about the accommodation. He felt they needed a new room in which to meet. And it was a room about half the size of the, of the current chapel. And although it was for worship and for prayer and for the reading of scriptures, it was also for what they called good works, for caring for people in the name of Christ, in the way in which Jesus had cared for the material needs as well as the spiritual needs of people. So, for instance, when this building was first opened, um, there was a school here during the daytime for children, and in the early morning and in the evening for adults. At one time he was employing six teachers here for, uh, to look after uh, the needs of the children and of the adults. Uh, medicines were dispensed here uh, for people who could not afford um, to go to the doctors in town. Um, he sold books here, and in a very bad winter, which was so bad that the water froze in the wells in Bristol. Um, he employed people here. He was so worried about the destitution that there was here. So it was for all the good purposes of God. Not just, it wasn't just a chapel. It was a multi-purpose building. Now, within nine years of building it, and he started to build it within about six weeks of arriving in Bristol, um, it was no longer large enough. And maybe he built it a bit too quickly, too. <laughs> maybe he didn't know who were the good builders in town. And he said, I think it was in 1748, that he feared the, the roof would come in on their heads. <laughs> so they needed to rebuild. So they took down everything that was unsafe and built the chapel as you have it now. That's the 1748 building. But also by then he discovered, when the preachers were coming to see him here in, in Bristol, he didn't have any accommodation for them. And to find cheap, safe, clean accommodation was not easy. So he decided to build a hostel on top of the chapel. That's where we are now. We're in the common room of the chapel. This was where they would sit and eat and meet and talk together. And the rooms around are the rooms where they would, where the preachers would sleep. The two rooms over there are John's rooms. The room where was his little sitting room, where he would sit and talk with people on a one-to-one -one basis, and then his, his little bedroom. And there was a housekeeper here um, to look after the place and to look after the preachers who came. And this is what he called, the people who were here at any time, he called the, the family of the new room. And the family of the new room were expected to be downstairs for a five o'clock service in the morning and also for the five o'clock service in the evening, which they did not always find easy, I think. One preacher wrote to him and said, Sir, uh, you will shorten our nights 
John told him if he were to retire early and raise early, rise early, it would lengthen his days. End of discussion. <laughs> So this is where we are. We're in the, in the common room where the preachers used to meet and where they stayed when they were in Bristol. What does this place mean to you? Why is, this, why is it important for Bristol Methodist? Why is it important for Methodists around the world? And why especially to you? Because you talked earlier when we first started about the power of this place in your life. There's something very special about it. The fact that method is over 275 years now. People of God have been meeting, praying, planning God's work, worshipping here. It has a very special feel about it. Um, and then you have all the sort of the personal associations. For instance, uh, when I was candidating for the ministry, I was interviewed here. Um, for the ministry. Um, I've always loved the place. I knew it as a boy as I made my way to school past here. Um, so it's very special in that way. Why it's special now is because it's a place of pilgrimage from Methodists all over the world who come here. This afternoon I've been talking to an Indian couple. He's a member of a, a Pentecostal church in India. And he wanted to come here because they look back on John and Charles as part of their heritage. There was an Indian Baptist here who I talked to, who was an itinerant preacher. And throughout the last 20 or so years, he'd wanted to come here because this is the place uh, where John Wesley had been. So it has that sense of having all sorts of encouragement within it. I mean, the fact for me, too, that it was a multi-purpose building, that it was for education. It wasn't just a preaching place. It wasn't just a place for singing Charles' hymns. It was where you looked after the education of the impoverished. It was where you provided them medicines. It was where you gave them food. It was where you found them employment. And that was all right and proper, because that was the needs of people, uh, which John felt to compel. Um, to respond to. And that relates, I think, to what I see in ministry. It's not just dealing with the religious side of life. It's to deal with the totality of living. And that appeals to me. So I am happy to work here. I love working here, in fact. We've been talking with the Reverend David Weeks. We're here in the New Room in Bristol, UK. Thank you so much for doing this, Reverend Weeks. A pleasure. And thank you, Will, for coming.